Welcome back. This is part two of our veterinary radiology lecture on lung infiltrates, veterinary chest x-rays, how to read lung infiltrates using a pattern-based approach. For those who are new here, I'm Dr. Vet Imaging, and you're watching Vet Imaging Lab, where we simplify veterinary radiology one step at a time. In part one, we covered the importance of checking pulmonary vessel visibility to determine if infiltrates are present. Then, in the second step, we learned how to classify the type of infiltrates, focusing on how to differentiate between alveolar and interstitial patterns, two of the three major lung infiltrate types. If you'd like a refresher on those concepts, feel free to check out part one before continuing. Now, in part two, we'll explore the remaining one of the three major patterns, bronchial patterns. We'll also continue with our systematic approach covering step three, step four, and step five to further refine our evaluation of lung infiltrates. Let's get started. Now, let's take a look at bronchial patterns and how they appear on radiographs. In this pattern, we see thickened bronchial walls, which form distinct tramline or ring-like shadows on x-rays. These changes occur when the bronchial walls become inflamed, accumulate mucus, or undergo mineralization over time. One of the key characteristics of the bronchial pattern is the prominent visibility of bronchial markings throughout the lung fields. Take a look at this radiograph. I've marked the bronchial infiltrates with yellow arrows for a tramline and a red arrow for a ring sign so you can clearly see them. Notice how the thickened bronchial walls create tramline and ring-like shadows. These changes indicate bronchial disease where inflammation or mucus accumulation causes the bronchi to become more prominent on x-rays. In this magnified radiograph, you can see the bronchial infiltrates more clearly, highlighted by the thickened bronchial walls. Even though the airways are more prominent, notice how the pulmonary vessels remain well-defined and visible. Wait a moment, are you confusing? The air bronchogram seen in alveolar infiltrates with the tramline appearance of bronchial wall thickening it's an easy mistake to make, but don't worry, we're going to clear it up right now. Let me explain you using these illustrations. In a normal lung illustration, both the bronchi and alveoli are filled with air, which makes them appear dark. As a result, they are not easily distinguishable from one another. This is why, on a normal chest x-ray, these structures blend into the surrounding lung field, making them difficult to separate. When alveolar infiltrates develop, the alveoli become more opaque, making the lung appear brighter on x-rays. However, the bronchi remain filled with air, so they still appear dark against this bright background. This contrast creates a characteristic branching pattern known as an air bronchogram. The key here is that only the alveolar spaces are filled with fluid or cells, while the bronchi remain open. This allows us to clearly see these dark air-filled bronchi within the bright infiltrated lung field, a hallmark sign of alveolar infiltrates. In bronchial infiltrates, the bronchial walls become visible on x-rays due to fluid accumulation or thickening of the bronchial walls. Normally, bronchial walls are too thin to be seen clearly, but when they become inflamed or thickened, they appear as white, well-defined lines surrounding the airway. This is what creates the characteristic tramline, or ring-like appearance, seen in bronchial patterns. Unlike alveolar infiltrates, where air bronchograms stand out against a bright lung background. Bronchial infiltrates make the airway walls more prominent while keeping the airway itself dark due to the air inside. This distinction is key when differentiating between bronchial and alveolar patterns on radiographs. Bronchial infiltrates are commonly seen in conditions like allergic airway disease such as feline asthma, chronic bronchitis, and bronchiectasis. This x-ray is a case of feline asthma. You can see the thickened bronchial walls making the airways more prominent. Because in many cases of feline asthma, interstitial infiltrates are also present, making the lungs appear dirty. All right, this case might be a bit challenging, so let's take a closer look. 
If you focus on the left lung, you'll notice multiple round, ring-like patterns. That's a classic sign of bronchial infiltrates. Where thickened bronchial walls create the tram line and ring-like effect. But do you see how some of these bronchi look dilated? That's because this patient has progressed to bronchiectasis, a condition where the bronchi become permanently widened due to chronic inflammation and damage. Now, shift your attention to the right lung, especially the middle and caudal lobes. The lung density is diffusely increased and pulmonary vessels are no longer visible. This tells us there's alveolar infiltration. And look closer. Within this dense lung field, you'll see multiple, small, round, black areas. These are air bronchograms, even though the bronchi are abnormally widened. The presence of air bronchograms further supports the presence of severe bronchopneumonia. So what's the bigger picture? This patient is suffering from severe bronchopneumonia that has progressed to bronchiectasis, resulting in a combination of bronchial and alveolar infiltrates. This mix of different lung patterns can make interpretation challenging. But by systematically analyzing the radiograph, starting with vessel visibility, pattern recognition, and distribution, we can break it down step by step. In our next lecture, we'll dive deeper into how to approach cases where multiple infiltrates overlap and how to refine our differential diagnosis. Stay tuned. Now, let's move to step three. Evaluating the distribution of lung infiltrates. The location and spread of infiltrates on x-rays can give us crucial clues about the underlying cause. If the infiltrates are focal, meaning they are confined to a single lobe, we often suspect conditions like lobar pneumonia or neoplasia. Here we have an example of a focal alveolar infiltrate. This dog has aspiration pneumonia. Take a look at this radiograph. Notice how the opacity is concentrated in a specific region rather than being widespread. In aspiration pneumonia, infiltrates commonly affect the right middle lung lobe, as aspirated material tends to settle there due to gravitational and anatomical factors. When infiltrates are scattered across different lung lobes, we describe them as multifocal. If the infiltrates affect large portions of both lungs, we call them diffuse. Diffuse distribution occurs when lung involvement is widespread rather than localized. As you can see here, in this dog with cardiogenic pulmonary edema, the infiltrates are diffusely distributed across both lungs. The perihelar region is another key area to assess. When infiltrates are concentrated here, cardiogenic pulmonary edema is a strong possibility. On the right radiograph, you can see increased lung density in the perihelar region highlighted by the yellow arrows. This is a classic feature of cardiogenic pulmonary edema, where fluid accumulation follows a predictable pattern due to increased hydrostatic pressure. Now, take a look at the heart. This dog has severe enlargement of the left atrium and ventricle, which strongly supports the diagnosis of cardiogenic pulmonary edema, secondary to mitral valve disease. The fourth step in evaluating lung infiltrates is to correlate radiographic findings with clinical history and symptoms. This is a crucial step because imaging alone doesn't always provide a complete diagnosis. Let me give an example. This patient presents with severe respiratory distress. Radiographs show diffuse interstitial and alveolar infiltrates. What could be causing these infiltrates? Since the infiltrates are diffusely distributed and radiographs show diffuse, interstitial, and alveolar infiltrates. Some major possibilities include, this could be cardiogenic or non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. A widespread bacterial or viral infection could lead to both interstitial and alveolar involvement. In addition, pulmonary hemorrhage caused by trauma, coagulopathy, or vasculitis can be considered. Based on the patient's history, symptoms, and lab data, we can now confirm that this is a case of pulmonary hemorrhage due to severe thrombocytopenia in Evans syndrome. The diffuse interstitial and alveolar infiltrates we initially observed align with pulmonary hemorrhage, 
and the lab findings of marked thrombocytopenia further support this diagnosis. This case highlights why integrating radiographic findings with clinical data is crucial in reaching an accurate diagnosis. The final step in evaluating lung infiltrates is considering further imaging when x-rays alone don't provide a definitive answer. Take a look at this radiograph. Notice the localized infiltrate in the left cranial lung lobe. At first glance, you might think this could be a simple pneumonia, but there's something unusual here. See how the lung margin appears rounded instead of the typical sharp border? This suggests that the lesion is not just an inflammatory process like pneumonia, but could involve mass-like lesion, such as abscess, lung lobe torsion, or even neoplasia. When we see atypical lung infiltrates like this, additional imaging, such as CT scans or ultrasound, becomes crucial to further characterize the lesion. After performing a CT scan, we were able to confirm that this patient has left cranial lung lobe torsion with abscess formation. Just like in this case, there are many situations where additional imaging, such as CT or ultrasound, is necessary to reach a definitive diagnosis. To help you better understand when and how to use these tools, I'll be preparing a special lecture on cases where additional imaging plays a crucial role. So stay tuned, there's a lot more to explore. Now let's summarize the radiographic characteristics of different lung infiltrates. I've put together a table that compares the key features of alveolar, interstitial, and bronchial infiltrates, so you can quickly recall their differences. Understanding these differences is essential for making an accurate diagnosis. All three infiltrate types involve the accumulation of fluid, hemorrhage, or cellular infiltrate, whether due to inflammation, infection, or neoplasia. However, the exact location and pattern of these infiltrates help differentiate between them. Interstitial infiltrates occur within the interstitial tissue as foggy or nodular opacities appearance. Alveolar infiltrates occur within the alveoli. This pattern is characterized by air bronchograms and lobar signs. Bronchial infiltrates are found in the bronchioles and peribronchial space and present as tram-like or ring shapes patterns, which represent thickened bronchial walls. Interstitial and bronchial infiltrates allow pulmonary vessels to remain visible. Even if they appear slightly blurred in interstitial patterns, alveolar infiltrates obscure pulmonary vessels, meaning their outlines are no longer distinct. If lung vessels are no longer visible in a certain area, it's a strong indication of alveolar infiltrates. As the distribution pattern, interstitial and alveolar infiltrates can be focal or diffuse, depending on the underlying cause. Bronchial infiltrates typically appear as multiple areas of involvement, emphasizing the bronchi rather than a single consolidated region. Has the classification of lung infiltrates based on patterns been well organized? By identifying whether the pattern is alveolar, interstitial, or bronchial, we can narrow down the differential diagnosis and determine the most likely underlying cause. And this pattern approach plays a crucial role in guiding treatment planning. By applying these principles in practice, we can improve diagnostic accuracy and provide the best possible care for our patients. All right, now let's wrap up everything we've covered in this lecture with some key takeaways. First, always start by checking the vascular visibility. Second, classifying lung infiltrates. Is it alveolar, interstitial, or bronchial? Identifying the pattern helps narrow down the possible causes. Next, consider the distribution. Is it focal, multifocal, or diffuse? This step is crucial in refining your differential diagnosis. Then, correlate with clinical findings. X-rays alone don't always tell the whole story. So always check the patient's history, symptoms, and lab results to get the full picture. Finally, when radiographs aren't enough, consider additional imaging like CT, ultrasound, or even biopsy to confirm your diagnosis. Remember, a systematic approach is the key to accurate interpretation and effective treatment planning. That's a wrap. Thank you for watching.
If you found this helpful, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe for more veterinary radiology content. See you in the next lesson.